Um, good morning, everybody. I, first, I would like to thank Molly for organizing this super meeting and inviting me. It's really a pleasure to be here. And the work I'm going to talk about is mainly a work achieved by Marjolaine Roussel during her PhD work in Institut des Sciences de l'Evolution de Montpellier. And it's about the relationship between the, the adaptive substitution rate and the effective population size. So I think it's widely admitted that adaptation is more effective in large populations. The main reason being that large populations tend to be genetically more diverse than small ones, and also they produce more mutants per generation. So you expect them to uh, be more likely to find or to carry the alleles required for responding to environmental changes. This, I think, was formulated by John Menasmith a long time ago and is also uh, a, a key aspect of the um, uh, theory of evolutionary rescue, for instance. And actually, if you think of a very simple model with a constant flux of beneficial mutations of selection coefficient s, independent, independently uh, incoming in population of size any, you expect, under some conditions, the adaptive rate to be proportional to the any new S product, so linearly related with, with any. But this equation has been criticized, uh, particularly by John Gillespie and Nick Barton, who recall that uh, it doesn't account for all the complexity of the population genetic processes, and particularly the fact that distinct beneficial mutations can segregate together in the population and compete. And for instance, Weissman and Barton uh, explicitly modeled um, linkage between beneficial mutations and concluded that um, when, if any is sufficiently <coughs> large, then what limits adaptation is no longer the ability of populations to find the, the, the adaptive mutations, but rather to recombine them across loci. Right. And also uh, studies of Fisher's geometric model uh, came to similar conclusions and um, demonstrated that uh, under a wide range of conditions, factors different from any probably determine the adaptive rate in the first place, especially when any is large. So maybe a kind of rough summary of this piece of, of the body of literature would be that the expected relationship between the adaptive rate and the effective population size or the population mutation rate is probably more something like this um, saturation curve, uh, like the red curve, rather than a, a linear relationship. And maybe the question is more uh, where on this uh, plot um, are true species actually located? Uh, are they somewhere like here, so uh, mutation limited, or maybe here, so not mutation limited? So empirically, we have some evidence that in primates, uh, the rate of selective sweep is higher in large than small populations, so perhaps suggesting that in primates there's some uh, mutation limitation of the adaptive rate. Whereas similar analysis in, in flies, uh, a comparison between a relatively small any and large any flies, uh, did not reveal uh, the same pattern. And still in insects and in Drosophila, um, the observation of a large number of independently, in, independent mutations at the ACE1 locus that confer resistance to insecticide uh, segregating in Drosophila melanogaster suggest that probably in this species um, adaptation to strong selective pressure actually uh, is not mutation limited. Right, so it could be that primates are located somewhere here. Okay, this doesn't seem to work much. And, and flies maybe there. And so maybe by, by taking a broader taxonomic scale in the analysis, we could see that the pattern emerge. So this is what I tried to do a couple of years ago when I analyzed the relationship between the, the rate of adaptive amino acid substitution and the population mutation rate across 44 species of animals, including insects and, and mammals. But I couldn't really uh, reveal any relationship that makes sense, despite um, showing that the adaptive rate seems to vary quite a bit between species. So this was a bit frustrating. And I shall add that a similar analysis had been conducted a couple of years before by Tony Gossman and Adam Walker 
this time sampling species in plant, animals, and fungi. And okay, so a weak positive trend was reported, but not so convincing. For instance, this species of mammal apparently has a much higher adaptive rate than this uh, yeast here. So I would say that the, the, the empirical evidence so far is a little bit equivocal, and uh, the signal se seems to vary depending on which species people analyze, which scale they consider, and also which method they use. And we still lack so far kind of a unifying picture of this relationship here. And so the, the main purpose of this talk would be to, to present the results we obtain uh, thanks to a, a novel data set that we have built in order to try and make progress with this issue. And this data set will include, includes bo both closely related and distantly related species that we analyze together. But before that, I thought I could maybe kind of review the kind of method we use to estimate the adaptive rate based on coding sequence population genomic data under the McDonald Creighton uh, framework. Right, so a couple of minutes on the method and then just uh, these recent results we, we've obtained uh, a couple of weeks ago. Right, so if you um, sequence a protein in two different species and compare the amino acid sequences, you're going to see differences, so non-synonymous differences, which correspond to substitutions having accumulated at the two lineages were diverging. Unfortunately, not all these substitutions are necessarily adaptive. Some of them are like uh, these ones here, anyway. Um, presumably correspond to neutral changes that have rich fixation through uh, genetic drift. And so the challenge here would be to discriminate among the non-synonymous divergence DN, the adaptive component DA versus the non-adaptive DNA. So actually, the divergence, the non-synonymous divergence is trivially controlled by or determined by um, mutation rate and divergence time. So we need to divide this number by the synonymous divergence to make it relevant. Um, these ratios are usually renamed using the letter omega. And so what we want to estimate here is this omega A statistics, which can be seen at the difference between the overall DNA over DS ratio and the non-adaptive component of the DNDS ratio. And McDonald and Kretzmann's idea in 1991 was to take information on omega from the divergence between two sister species and to estimate the non-adaptive component from within species polymorphism data with the idea that adaptation perhaps negligibly affects this compartment of the diversity. So let's see a little bit in more detail how it works. Um, so synonymous mutations are assumed to be neutral. They contribute some amount of polymorphism, PS, some amount of divergence, DS, between species. Now let's consider non-synonymous mutations. Some of them are deleterious. They remove by natural selection. We don't observe them. Some of them are neutral and they contribute to polymorphism and divergence in proportion to their number or their rate. And finally, a tiny fraction of the non-synonymous mutations are adaptive. Because they are very rare, they're supposed, they assume, to contribute negligibly to polymorphism. But because they have such an elevated fixation probability, they might contribute substantially to divergence. And this DA term here is what we want to estimate. So under this very simple model of the distribution of fitness effect of mutations with only large effect uh, mutations, actually, the adaptive substitution rate omega A is simply expressed as the difference between the DN over DS ratio and the pi N over pi S ratio. So this is the, this is the basic idea of McDonald and Kreitman. One problem is that in the real world, we also have Intermediate effect mutations. Um, okay, I, I can I can spot them. And these mutations do contribute to polymorphism and to divergence to some extent, which is not so easily expressed 
by such simple equations. So particularly, slightly deleterious mutations can segregate in populations and contribute to the non-synonymous diversity. So we need, to, we need to estimate how much they contribute. And to do this, the idea is not only to look at the numbers of SNPs, of polymorphism, but also their population frequencies, which are typically summarized in so-called side frequency spectra, so the distribution of added frequency yeah, in sample, in a population sample. And so as you know, uh, deleterious mutations tend to segregate at a lower frequency than neutral ones. So uh, what we want to, we, we want to extract information out of the amount of um, distortion of the non-synonymous SFS compared to the synonymous one. Information on the distribution of and strength of slightly deleterious mutations. We want to integrate this in the model. We have equations for the Trojan time of a, of a mutation of a given selection coefficient in the population. And this way, correct uh, or improve uh, our estimation of the adaptive rate. This is the idea. This is typically achieved in the maximum likelihood context. So the data are the divergence and polymorphism for synonymous and non-synonymous uh, mutations. And the model has four categories of parameters. We have a divergence parameter, mu t. We have the population mutation rate, any mu. The distribution of fitness effect of mutations, which is typically modeled as the gamma distribution, but other shapes have been, have been tried also. And also this nuisance RI's parameter that are introduced in the equations. Um, they are supposed to capture effects like demographic or population structure effects that affect the synonymous and non-synonymous compartment to the same extent. So this approach has been introduced by Adam Erwoken and Peter Keithley like 10 years ago and more recently a bit extended in, in a couple of groups and I'm here showing four programs that are currently available in the, in, in the literature that, that implement this method with slightly different options. There are a number of assumptions that we need to be aware of when using these methods. So we assume that neutral mutations, sorry, synonymous mutations are neutral, which is not always true. We also assume Directional selection only, so no balancing selection or local adaptation. And meaning that, I mean, which means that we actually um, assume that the effect of non-synonymous mutation on polymorphism patterns is negligible. But this assumption can be, um, um, how do you say that? We're, we're, well, this, this has been studied a little bit in the two papers I'm mentioning here. It doesn't seem to be, to be so critical. Maybe a bit more importantly, the basic MK method assumes mutation selection drift equilibrium and particularly no effect of um, other forces like GC biogen conversion, which is um, generalized uh, this segregation distortion that affects most species of animals and favors GNC alleles over ANT alleles. So yeah, this is something that can dramatically affect estimates of the adaptive rate and should be taken into account. So the, the idea here is simply to restrict the analysis to mutations that are immune from this process. So C to G and G to C mutations or A to T or T to A mutations. And another important assumption of the MK method is that the long-term effective population size that determines the rate of accumulation of such deleterious mutations as substitutions is supposed to be equal to the short-term one, so, so that polymorphism and divergence com compartment can be compared. And when this is not the case, then the method can be biased, as was mentioned by Adam Awok a long time ago, and we also recently kind of quantified the amount of bias you can, you, you can expect from a departure from this, this assumption. So, uh, we tend to think that ancient bottlenecks that uh, took place before the last common ancestor of um, well, the, the, the coalescence time of the individuals we sampled, this the kind of event tend to make us overestimate the adaptive rate in classical 
implementations of the AMK method. Right. So we apply this tool to, um, to a new data set that we generated in Marjolaine's thesis. Um, so here are numbers that you're not supposed to read. Um, so we have built a data set of 50 species by targeting 10 distantly related group of animals. So we have primates, ants, foals, rodents, passerines, butterflies, flies, ribbon worms, earthworms, and mussels. And in each of these uh, taxa, we sampled four to six species, five to 20 individuals per species, and a couple of thousand of genes were sequenced. Um, so half of this data set has been generated in the context of this project, so the red arose uh, using um, exon capture experiments, and, and the other half comes from published uh, data. So for each of these genes, we called uh, GPE genotype uh, at every position, and we gathered all the SNPs into a single data set per species. So this way, obtaining some sort of a genome-wide estimated adaptive uh, amino acid substitution rate in 50 different species from, from 10 groups. So this is the row relationship between omega A, the adaptive rate, and theta, the population mutation rate for this data set. So nothing really seems to fit uh, the expectation uh, seen this way. Um, here, colors, so species, it, it's just for species, and in this slide, species have been colored according to groups. And so, yeah, not really, nothing really um, meaningful appears, but in this slide here, I'm also drawing regression lines within each group. And this is when some sort of pattern seems to finally emerge. So what we see here is that, and seems to be significant um, via uh, analysis of covariance, is that there seems to be a positive relationship within groups between omega A and theta. And what's also significant is that the slope of the regression line differs between groups and declines as we move from low theta to high theta taxa. So taxa such as primates or ants or rodents um, seems to show a steep relationship between omega A and theta, but the relationship is no longer detectable in butterflies or mussels, for instance. So we seem to see some sort of a uh, mutation limitation of the adaptive rate in small any taxa, but not in large any taxa, which maybe makes sense. On the other hand, as you can see, there is no obvious relationship between groups, and this is something we verified by building group-level estimates of omega A. So we used two different approaches to combine the information from different species into a single estimate at group level uh, that differed a little bit in their assumptions, but anyway, both essentially support if any, a negative relationship between the adaptive rate and theta at this level, which is a bit unexpected and uh, deserves some explanation, I guess. And so, yeah, these results, I need to say, um, have been obtained by averaging, so each estimate here or here is obtained by averaging the estimated adaptive rate across different models weighting models by their archaic case informative criterion um, as a weight. And also these results are robust to a control for GC bygen conversion obtained by simply focusing on A2T, T2A, C2G, G2C mutations. Right, so the question I was asking at the beginning of this talk, is adaptation limited by the supply of limitations the answer seems to be yes in low theta groups of animals, but no in high theta groups of animals, which kind of 
is consistent with the literature and is maybe confirmed here and extended to a wider group, to a larger sample of animals. So it looks like the, um, any, the, the range of effective population size occupied by actual species of animals um, span you know, the whole x-axis of the plot I was showing in the beginning of this, of this graph. So this is OK. But the other, a bit maybe unexpected and less consistent result we obtain is that when we compare the average omega a across groups, we don't see any re positive relationship with theta. And if any, the relationship appears to be negative. So obviously, something different from any is at work here and confounds the comparison. So of course, uh, these animals differ by many aspects besides any. So there are reasons to think that, well, I mean, there are reasons to dig a little bit deeper and try to understand why this happens. And here are a number of hypotheses that have been kind of discussed in the literature recently. Um, first, I would like to recall that in this analysis, we use the same gene set within a group. So all species within a group share the same genes. But of course, between groups, we have different sets of genes. And a number of recent papers have demonstrated that the adaptive rate of a given gene heavily depends on its function. So for instance, in, in, in some of the facts that we have, if by chance we have sample more immunity genes, then obviously this can bias the estimate at group level. So this is kind of a trivial effect that we need to control for. Besides, um, another thing to recall is that what we're measuring with the ordinal treatment approach is the number of adaptive steps, irrespective of the fitness effect of each of these steps. So actually, a population that will adapt very efficiently and move to its optimum in just one step would get a an estimate of the rate lower than a population that would take more steps to climb uh, an adaptive peak, right? So um, yeah, this, this has to be taken into account. And actually, if you think in terms of Fisher's geometric model, what determines the number of steps you expect uh, in an, an adaptive walk is essentially complexity. So the number of dimensions of the space, which is not something easy to define or to relate to the biology of species, but could be reasonable to maybe speculate that uh, small any taxa, like maybe mammals, could be more complex, maybe in the sense of more complex interaction between proteins. And so this might be a reason why we see, we see more adaptive steps in such taxa. And finally, there's also the idea that, that was published recently, that um, another feature of um, phenotypic space or um, that, that determine the adaptive rate is how far from the optimum you tend to be, right? So if species are always well adapted, um, uh, there's no more room for additional adaptation, right? So there could be the idea that a genome that have evolved during a long period of time in low any could have proteins that tend to be further away from the optimum compared to a well-optimized genome. And this also could be one reason why the adaptive rate that we measure tends to be higher in small any taxa than in large any taxa. I'm finished. Thank you for your attention.